So I got a little bit of a hodgepodge here, which is going to be kind of fun, I think, I hope. Uh, if you've got questions or concerns, or if something I say doesn't make any sense or it's crazy, please stop me and correct me or help me. Um, but what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about a project that happened by accident, actually. Uh, where'd Chris go? Did Chris leave? Oh, he's outside. Okay, good. So I can lie. <laughs> so I can lie and blame a bunch of stuff on Chris Walsh because he's gone. He's outside. So um, in uh, 2008, uh, I started doing some work at Keatesville at our research farm, and I just put this here is because this is kind of where we started. This is where our orchards were in 2008. Um, we weren't. Uh, probably up to speed. Uh, we, we had lagged behind a little bit. We had a lot of issues with uh, survival. Things were getting old. Not quite where they wanted, where we wanted them to be. Uh, and certainly not where we wanted that facility to be. So we thought that it was important to try to get something going and try to move forward a little bit looking at new technologies and apples. And we were very fortunate by a, an accident, Chris was able to, to, to secure some trees for us. And these trees were supposed to go to two other states first. Uh, they'd been riding around in a truck for a long time. And uh, we finally were able to, to get the trees and we threw them in. And uh, we actually didn't throw them in. We really tried to do a good job with this because this was our first high density planting on wire on trellis at, at Keatesville. Um, I've always been one that kind of liked to keep things simple. You know, my dad had an orchard. We were 40 by 40 was our spacing. You know, all the trees were big. We grew wine saps. We grew golden delicious. We grew red delicious. Grimes golden, yellow delicious. What else did you need? That was all there was. Everything was fine. We grew them for years. Everything was great. You know, you pruned what you pruned. What you didn't, you know, you just went, you know, it was, it was a, in a lot of ways, an easier way to go, but it was a very slow process to get the orchard going. And it certainly took up a lot of space. So in my whole time in working with orchards, I've always liked freestanding trees. I've always preferred that, lower inputs. But we could really see the trend. How many bushels you yield? And so if we can yield more per acre, we can be more productive. So we were able to get some interesting stuff here. We have G202 and G202 tissue culture. So the 202 was... Um, so we had some pretty good rootstocks out of the Geneva program, two different propagations on the, on the uh, 202s, and then for our science, we used Crips Pink and uh, Brooksfield Gala. Two kind of different apples there, so we could see how things were going to act. Um, it's all a replicated planting. Uh, we set it in there, I think, in, in the best way we could. We really, as you can see, we went in and we really worked the site. We prepped the site. We tried to do it as correctly as we possibly could. So we put this in in 2010. We had seven trees per panel. Everything was replicated four times. Um, Four wires on our trellis, and we've kind of stayed with the four wire system. I know there are a lot of other advances on that, but we really, I like the four wires because I like manipulating the branches. And I've had people like Dwight Bogger over in my county say to me, I'm not doing that, that takes too long. You know, I don't want to do that. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever, but I like being able to place the branches and getting things to yield really quickly. Um, so we got some pretty nice trees. We got all kind of laid in there. Uh, there's a picture of Dr. Walsh uh, making the planting. Um, we wanted to look at fruit quality. We wanted to look at tree size, productivity, and then tree survival. We wanted to see how these would work on this tall spindle system. Um, to the north of us, um, Everyone's going tighter and tighter and tighter with these spacings. And you just heard the global warming talk and, or climate change talk. And you know, we, we obviously have difference in our climate. And we felt that it was really, really important that we do some of this work as close to home as possible. Because you can take work from, from Cornell or from Michigan or from Washington. And there's a lot of great research, tremendous research, a lot of great information. But sometimes you got to put something in your backyard and really see how it acts at home. And that's really what we were trying to do with this project, was see how these trees would act. So we did space them six feet apart. Uh, they're 12 feet in the row, or between rows, but six feet in the row, not three. A lot of people were very critical. You should have packed them in tighter. But we were concerned that these trees would be very vigorous. And down here in Maryland, uh, and, and even more so down here, 
they would be very vigorous and they would fill the space too quickly and they'd be, we couldn't really keep them under control. So what did we learn from this whole project? Well, um, it did not take long for them to fill their space. That's the bottom line here. Um, as far as, as filling in pretty much by the third leaf in the six foot spacing, we had, we had, a complete, we had our complete space. And we stopped taking the height data particularly because we had already gone to the top wire and over and we were already trying to hold them back and we'd gone into renovation pruning. So we had started to do the renovation to make that slender spindle work. We were trying to follow some of the slender spindle rules to make it work properly. Um, so we did fill the space quickly and we did get a nice uh, you know, sort of wall of, of trees. Uh, from a fruit quality perspective, the whole way through with the gala and the pink ladies or the Crips pink, there was no difference on any of the rootstocks. All of these, the fruit was harvested. Chris took it down to the lab down in College Park. They looked at all these different uh, character or these different um, different things with the fruit to see how it acted or how it was going to, you know, if, if there was any change, any difference, and there was none. So that was kind of good to know because. I'm not sure how many of you have shopped for Geneva rootstocks. How many of you have shopped specifically to get like G41? Is it easy? How about 11? 202, 16, any of them. And with what you want on them, right? It's gotten very challenging. It's very difficult for the nursery business to keep up with the demand, right? It's just, it's a, it's a different world. It's very challenging with all these rootstocks coming out so quickly, with varieties coming out so quickly, the orchard industry has just changed. As I was talking earlier, you know, back in the day, we had a seedling rootstock and wine sap apples, and that's what we had, and that's what it was, and that was it for 20, 30 years. Now we're changing like this. So it was, I thought, nice to know that at least across that small sampling, we didn't see any difference in the actual fruit. Now what we did see with the gala was, on the 202 trees, the fruit was smaller. There was a difference there. On the Crips Pink, there was really no difference across the board. But with Gala, 202, the fruit was smaller. Now, here's the thing. I've always learned this. I guess it's just like some, there must be a name for this law. If something's really good at something, it must not be good at something else, <laughs> right? There's never anything that's good at everything, right? It's like you're trying to build, it's like, um, you know, you're trying to build a car and it's got to go fast, get great gas mileage, be able to hold the whole family, be able to take it out to dinner, you know, be able to look good when you're driving across, the, you know, the, the, the beach, whatever. It's impossible. And so with rootstocks, um, there are some really good things about 202, but this, for smaller fruit, that was, that was a bit of a problem with Gala. For yield, here we go again. 202 yielded less with Gala. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge too. So not only is it smaller fruit, but it's lower yields. But again, keep in mind, there's some other good things about 202. Um, 202 was lower yields uh, also, oops, oh, uh oh, I didn't do it, Mike. I swear, I'm sure those phones will come back on. <laughs> you got, I'm sure it's fine. I didn't get shocked, so it can't be that bad, right? Okay, so less, so, but then with Pink Lady, we really didn't see any differences in the yield. So that was kind of cool too. The reason I put this th little thinning note down there is because you notice that the yield went down in 2015. Just to show that I do make mistakes, I always try to say, tell people, you come to Keatysville, you get invited into the underwear drawer. So you get to see what we really did. And, you, and I don't hold any, you know, back. So, why did the yield go down? Because I overthinned the trees. Because I got a little too carried away. Said if a little bit is good, a lot's better, right? No, that didn't work. So anyway, I'm kind of telling all myself there. But you can see there really was no difference. But 30, uh, 41 and, 30 and uh, 935 both yielded pretty well. Now, with the TC trees, <clears throat> you can see the yield's pretty good there with Crips Pink. It was very interesting. The TC tree, was gigantic with, with particularly Gala. It's huge. Has anyone dealt with tissue culture strawberries? Has anyone gotten, you have. Nice, big, robust, really big. How about raspberries that have been tissue cultured? A few people, big, heavy, robust, strong. Man, the same thing comes across with this TC rootstock. 
big, heavy tree, won't stop growing, won't settle, won't stop. Now, it's settling a little bit in its eighth, ninth leaf now, but it's still a big, heavy, robust tree. So it would be important if you were buying 202s to know is it tissue cultured or not, because the two trees acted quite differently. Um, but anyway, here with, Gale, with Crips Pink, there really was no difference across the board with yield. Now, tree survival, and this is where it gets exciting. Um, I said some trees are good at some things, some trees are not good at other things. Well, when we get into this survival issue, in 2011, we had a storm. And it was kind of a bad storm. It was, you know, not like, oh no, you know, the buildings blew away, but it was kind of bad. So I do this because I just was at Keatesville last week and I tell the story and it's okay because he won't mind. I call up Doug, who's the, who works there at Keatesville, Doug Price, and I said, hey Doug, how do the trees look? Is everything fine? He says, everything's fine. All the trees are standing. I drove by the orchard, everything looks good. Well, of course, all of the trees are connected to the trellis, right? They're, and at that time, they were taped to the trellis. So everything looked good, right? So everything looked fine that day, the next day, the next day. I get a phone call, and it's like, something, something doesn't seem right. Some of the trees are starting to wilt really bad. And I'm like, well, so what do you think could be going on? Well, they had broken, and they were just hanging on the trellis. So we lost quite a few trees, actually. And over, over a number of years, over the years of the study, actually, G41, we lost a lot of trees. Now, this is Crips Pink in particular. With Gala, we didn't lose nearly as many trees. We lost very few trees with Gala. Look at 202. 202 had the smallest fruit, had the lowest yield with Gala, but it, with Crips Pink particularly, and then in Gala too, it survived. It did not break. It never broke. But 41, which was a great rootstock, which is a great sized tree, which is really cool, we lost a lot of trees. Um, 935, we lost a lot of trees. Um, TC trees, we lost a few, but not too many, but we did lose some. So this is what it looked like as we're losing them, and we continue to lose them. Um, I'm going to go on real quickly to a study that Carrie Peters come over from Penn State, and she's working on with us. And we're having trouble, we're using this, this is converted into a different study now, but we're having trouble getting the study laid in here because we're losing so many trees because the 41s continue to break. And this is not the updated number here on breaking, but they just keep snapping at the graft union. And for, for more or less, no real good reason. Not a gigantic storm, we didn't hit them with the tractor, nothing terribly bizarre, boom, they're just broken. So we did lose a number of trees. Now, what's important to remember as I move now into the next part of this and start talking about some of these other things, and I'll tell on myself in case I run out of time, and you'll stop me right at, at 11, right? Okay. So we did not lose one tree to fire blight. We've lost a lot of trees, but every tree we lost is because it broke at the graft union. We didn't lose any trees for any other reason in this whole project. We only lost them because they broke at the graft union. We, <clears throat> August 2015, I thought, how am I going to explain this and what have I done? We had a storm on August the 25th, 2015. We had hail, we had a lot of wind, we had a lot of rain. And it looked like somebody went in there and just basically took the whole planting and just torched it. We had fire blight going everywhere. It looked like a disaster area. And here we are on these Geneva rootstocks, and we're very positive, things are looking good. We've lost some, but things are looking good. We had applied our streptomycin a number of times. We, we had another storm back in June, and we had applied it then too. So we felt like we were up to date, that we had used our strep sprays as we should have used them. But what happened to us was, and where this was really particularly bad is, is everyone kind of familiar with the way a slender spindle works or tall spindle works? You're doing a lot of renewing, renewal pruning, right? You're leaving these stubs. When, when a lateral gets to a certain diameter, you're going to remove that lateral with a stub, and then you're going to break a, new, a bud and then have a renewal shoot come out and keep filling the space in and keep working the tree up and down. Well, as I had said, 
a couple of years prior to this, we had filled the space. So we had already started to go into you know, renewing some of the branches so they didn't get too heavy. Well, <clears throat> these renewal chutes just got smashed. Everywhere where we had these nice renewal chutes, bam, it came right back into the trunk of the tree, right back into there and made a big tanker. And so this is what it started looking like. We had situations like this here where you'd have these renewal chutes, it came back the renewal chutes, and we had these huge cankers in the trees. And it looked like, I mean, it looked like the end of the world. It really looked bad. And it was on all of the gala. It was on quite a few of the pink ladies. Less of the pink ladies, it was more on gala is where we were affected most. Um, so it was kind of a mess. Now what this, we thought was gonna happen was, well, people would say, so what do you do now? You know, what do you do with this orchard that has only been in there for five years, that's really starting to bear well now, You've lost a few trees because they've been breaking. So if you're a producer, what do you do? Well, the real answer to me was I had no idea what to do. There, should we cut the cankers out? Should we cut the trees down? Should we cut them back and top work the trees? What should we do to get around these cankers? Well, what we did is we basically left them. We just said, we need to see what's going to happen. We need to see how bad this is going to get and how are these trees going to react because the Geneva rootstocks are fire blight resistant or tolerant. Well, what happened is the cankers are there, the cankers are still there, but the trees have grown, the trees have been very productive, and we've worked all around it. Um, we did cut shoots out and things like that. When we got dry periods, we did try to clean the trees up, but we didn't do anything to the cankers at all. It didn't change the management at all, but we didn't lose any trees. We didn't do anything to the trees, and we didn't lose any, we didn't lose any to fire blight. So a couple of things that we've, we've learned here was that there was really no difference in fruit quality. The 202s of Gala, we had smaller fruit and lower yield. We lost an awful lot of uh, 41 and 935 trees to, with Crips Pink on them. Um, 202 and TC, we lost very few. Um, we did have, of course, this issue with this. And this is 2017, and actually the picture above is when the folks from Penn State came over and we're starting to lay the plots in, Boom, we go the tree, and it's hard to see with the light, and I apologize, but the tree that they're standing at is starting to wilt because it had just broken. And we're out there, and boom. So um, we need to look at some different things here, and part of where we're going to go with this is we're looking at some opportunities, right, Chris, to dissect some of these graft unions, send them away. And also uh, make sure that it's not a virus that was in the bloodwood. Because... It just was really particularly bad in those Crips Pink. The Gala, it was, not, it, was, it was nominal, but it was particularly bad there. So we're looking at doing some of these things to kind of get a little bit more information out of this. But what you, know, what you do is, of course, you start working on one project, which is looking at these tall spindles, looking at these root stocks. You run into a problem, and so what do you do? You find another problem. You, know, you, you go from one problem to the next problem. So the biggest problem that we really identified was these renewal shoots and fire blight. It just felt like here we are in Maryland just setting ourselves up. Like, is this possibly something that doesn't work for us? Is this something maybe we shouldn't do? Um, it, should we be looking at other ways to grow these trees? Because are we particularly sort of predisposing ourselves to fire blight problems? So um, Carrie Peter came down and we wanted to look at this opportunity to use um, some growth regulators to see if maybe we could slow down the growth of some of these shoots and maybe get them to harden off a little bit more quickly and to, um, to uh, uh, maybe, maybe reduce some of the fire blight problems. But the reason we have this picture here is because up our way, and I'm sure down here too, there are an array of orchard type systems. There are many different ways that we're growing trees. And there's not that standard way. You know, people will call up and say, how do I prune my apples? And I'm like, oh my goodness, you know? What variety is, what rootstock is it? You know, how are you growing it? How old is the tree? Da -da 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 -da. There's a million questions that go along with, you know, how do you just do this? There's not one simple answer. Um, so what we wanted to look at was, would there be an opportunity for us to maybe control the growth of some of these um, renewal shoots and maybe have less fire blight problems. Well, we knew there wouldn't be any one, foot, one uh, size fits all type of situation here, but we wanted to see if we could do something with it. So um, we got our Apogee, and we thought that we would try to control this vigor. We'd harden these shoots off. Um, 
we felt that if we could get it on in a proper timing, we, we looked at it really from two ways. We looked at it just controlling fire blight generally in the tree and then controlling it on these renewal shoots. Um, and we were looking at you know, how much we could reduce this if we could reduce it. Now the interesting thing about this, this part of the study was we had to infect the trees, right? So we started this in 2016. So we went in and they started inoculating the trees. And they're inoculating the, regular, the growth on the trees and then they started re re inoculating the renewal shoots. Well in 2016, we couldn't even get the fire blight to stick. So the whole year was really a bust. We really had no data that we could collect because we couldn't get fire blight to get going in the orchard again. So that was kind of a unique situation. Um, but the big thing here with using these growth regulators was we were a little concerned if we go crazy with these things in this, in this type of system that you're renewing all the time, are you going to stunt the trees to the point that you don't fill the space anymore? So we wanted to see what we could do uh, with, with filling the space and then these lower rates maybe on some of these different products. Um, so we got together, we started looking at Apogee, the, like I say, the first year it was just a complete bust, 2016. Um, so we came back the second year and said, well, let's try this again. They're also working on this at Penn State too, at the uh, Freck, at the research farm in Adams County. It's a slightly different experiment, but it's allowing Kerry to get a lot more data together. Uh, and we definitely had the problem here. So we were the ones that sort of were like the poster child for fire blight in this. And um, they haven't had nearly as much trouble as we have. But um, anyway, I guess that's a good thing or a bad thing. But they're using kudos and we're using Apogee. Um, OK, so we're making four applications. Um, this is all replicated through the planting, again, on both varieties. Um, we wanted to see how things would look. Um, they inoculated the shoots in April, uh, we wanted to see just what would happen. Same for the plantings, yep, you know about that. Okay, so nothing's easy and nothing comes out the way you think and it really makes sense at first, I guess. So um, here we are with the current year's growth, Apogee, at one ounce reduced fire blight on Gala. So at Penn State, the one ounce didn't reduce fire blight but it did for us. So then you see the, ra the other rates, well, they work pretty well, I guess, but um, everything works kind of the same, it appears at least. But you can see we had fire blight at least. That's at our one ounce. Um, now current season growth, again, these are not our renewal shoots. This is, these are just shoots in the tree um, that are growing. This is so it's kind of a split experiment a little bit. Um, so here we are, Apogee at high and low rates, did not significantly reduce fire blight severity in Crips Pink. So we really didn't see any variation at all. It didn't seem like it did much of anything. But again, we start getting up around this four ounce rate. You know, we want to be careful. We don't want to make these trees, we don't want to stunt the trees or hold the trees back too much. So we're trying to keep the rates down as low as we possibly can. Um, so when you put all of, the, all of the data together that she had, the current year's growth, all rates of Apogee reduced fire blight severity when, com when combining all the cultivars. So all the work she was doing with us, with Gala and with Crips Pink and the work they were doing uh, at Penn State, it did appear to have some effect. So the renewal shoots. Now this is what I was really most concerned about because this is where I thought maybe we're setting ourselves up. So this was a, a, the second part of that experiment. And so we're looking at these renewal, we make these renewal cuts in the winter, we get this new growth, we're trying to see what we, what we come up with here on these. So the evaluations from these were done June the 9th. Renewal shoots, fire blight severity reduction in gala. Well, uh, maybe, kind of, I don't know. <laughs> it gets worse, it gets better, um, but really there's no difference. Um, so it didn't seem to do anything on the renewal shoots with Gala. On, on Pink Lady, uh, or Crips Pink rather, well, there again, it really didn't do anything again. So the renewal shoots, it may be doing something, it may not be doing something, it really wasn't clear. So combining the cultivars, the Apogee did not reduce fire blight severity at all. So when we put all the data together on our renewal shoots, it didn't work. So, 
I guess, you know, that's why you do the work, because you want to see what's going to happen and how things are going to go. There are certainly a lot of variables in this, and I think we're trying to work through this. We're going to do this again next year. Again, like I say, the first year didn't work at all. The second year, we got confusing data. Now we're trying to look at a third year to see if we can get some clarification and maybe some direction to move this forward in a direction. Um, but the good side of it is, is that we really haven't had problems with fire blight in those trees. I mean, things are looking really good. So comparatively speaking, we're in pretty good shape. Um, so this is, this carries sort of final slide here. We're just thanking everybody. We had a bunch of people coming over from FREC working on this and Doug over at the research fund laying these, pro these plots out. But a few things that we've learned from this whole project and where we're going with this is this Fuji on uh, M9337, this is Daybreak Fuji, boy, that's a size tree I really like. We planted those trees in 2012. They've, bear, they've borne well every year. They're just a really nice size tree. It's a nice pedestrian orchard. And what we're really doing our work towards is that pedestrian pick your own type orchard. Something that's not real tall, something that stays in bounds, something you can manage and yields fairly well. Um, other work that we're looking at here is we're looking at uh, Honeycrisp on a variety of different rootstocks. We've laid in a replicated plot of these um, with, with the different rootstocks to see if there's any effects on, on fruit quality uh, with all of those different rootstocks. Um, and then we've also went ahead and planted some other rootstocks, and this is the list that we were able to get. We talked about availability at three foot spacing and six foot spacing to look more closely at how these trees manage over time at these different spacings. Um, we've, we kind of like the six, but a lot of people are three and, and closer. So I've got them at both different sizes or different spacings just to see how these trees manage. And it's much more of a demonstration. But again, I tell people, come look at the underwear drawer. You can come, you can walk through the orchard, you can look, everything's marked. And we keep it there so that people can can actually go in and see it at different times and see how things are going. Um, this may seem crazy to some of you, but some people have asked. Uh, they've got bad sites. They've got different situations. They wanted to look at some freestanding trees. So we've put in a block of 969 freestanding uh, trees. Um, actually, the rootstock the, the, the root is 969. The varieties that will go on these are all out of Dr. Thompson's variety block that he had maintained. So. Um, we're putting those varieties on 969 and we're just really looking at the 969 rootstock to see what it does and how it stands because we had some problems with it breaking initially. This whole block has been put in and we really haven't had any problems. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody, particularly the Hort Society, all the folks at Keatiesville for all the support that they give me. Um, I kind of blew through that. Uh, Carrie had made a nice presentation there and I wanted to share that. She was sad that she couldn't come this year but she's got such a busy schedule, but I think we've got a great pathologist uh, uh, to, to make up for that too. So I didn't want to get too much into pathology. So I guess maybe a question or no? Are you going to be here through lunch? I am going to be here through lunch. Okay. Oh, yeah,